again, you're being an activist. I am not. That's not appropriate, sir. Who are you with? What's your name? That's not an appropriate question for you to ask. I do. You're going to ask how many questions? You get three. Welcome to another episode of Friendly Fire, a show dedicated to libertarian candidates for public or party office. Usually, this show focuses on interviewing fellow libertarians and reviewing legislation, the bill review portion of the show. I've decided to expand the show slightly and periodically use it to discuss notable party matters. The goal of the show remains the same. Raise the bar on how we engage within the political process. If giving an interview, it should be tough but fair. When reviewing legislation, it should be critical but honest. And when discussing notable libertarian party matters, it should be critical and tough, but fair and honest. The Classical Liberal Caucus put out their 2023 State of the, Un- uh, State of the Libertarian Party report last week, May 26. The report was intended to, quote, reflect the current state of the Libertarian Party using publicly available information and to propose viable strategy to turn things around. The CLC's report was met with rebuke by those aligning with the Mises Caucus and support by those aligning with the CLC. As always, there are those outliers. This episode of Friendly Fire will examine the report with a critical but honest, tough but fair evaluation. Let me start by providing a disclaimer. I am not in opposition to the CLC, but I have, over time, become more sympathetic to the Mises Caucus. That said... If you stay with me, I believe you'll find this show provides the most honest evaluation of their report by somebody who is not necessarily on their side. Members on both sides have reached out for conversation regarding the CLC's report. I decline so as to give the most fair reading as written. I also intentionally did not engage in debate on Twitter. The CLC sent an advanced copy to the LNC to which Todd Hagopian, the LNC treasurer, responded. The CLC then included an addendum in the public version responding to him. Therefore, I did include Todd's response and a few follow-up tweets from the CLC chair, Jonathan Casey. Now, let's get into it. The introduction says, quote, The CLC envisions the Libertarian Party's mission to be about securing candidate nominations, winning elections, and advancing legislation, all within the framework of libertarian principles. There isn't another organization in the nation that consistently aims at these goals through the electoral process. There is no alternative organization that persistently presents libertarian candidates to the electorate. Therefore, it's vital that we carry out these tasks as proficiently and economically as we can. I agree with this statement, with the exception of the very last sentence, that we may be the only organization persistently presenting libertarian candidates and, to some degree, ideas does not make the duty of our organization to be proficient or economically more or less vital. Every organization has those duties in order to fulfill its mission. Our organization, however, is volunteer-based. We are subject to disagreement and even division on the basis of how we seek to achieve the goals of securing candidate nominations, winning elections, and advancing legislation. Therefore, I argue what is vital is that we as a party learn to coalesce. Our national party bylaws support the mission of nominations, elections, and legislation as well. Article 2 of our bylaws states the party is organized to implement and give voice to the principles embodied in the Statement of Principles by functioning as a libertarian political entity separate and distinct from all other political parties or movements, electing libertarians to public office to move public policy in a libertarian direction, chartering affiliate parties throughout the United States, and promoting their growth and activities, nominating candidates for president and vice president of the United States, and supporting party and affiliate party candidates for political office, and entering into public information activities. My commentary from this point forward will reflect my perception of this report against the stated purposes in our national party bylaws. This report is 20 pages long, and I will highlight only what I believe are the most relevant parts for consideration. Continuing on, the report says, 
This report is designed to reflect the current state of the Libertarian Party by using publicly available information and to propose viable strategies to turn things around. My first issue is that this report tells me its conclusion right away. Things need to be turned around. Page 2 and the report already suggest it is biased and lacks objectivity. Now one might counter by saying, DL, the CLC, has their vision for how the party should operate, and it's no secret that it differs from the Mises Caucus, who currently has control of the ship. I think the idea of an LNC report card from caucuses is a good thing, and we'll explore that more in my conclusion. <clears throat> my expectation is that such reports edify the organization while being critical and tough, but fair and honest. A report that accomplishes this does not need to lead with statements like, quote, this report will attempt to refrain from finger pointing or we will try not to dwell on how we arrived here. It will be self-evident as one reads. Moving along, the report's introduction concludes saying this, a few initial points to consider before diving into the report. American politics operates in two-year cycles, which will be a recurring theme in this report as we compare the present cycle with its predecessors aiming for an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. Unless specified otherwise, our focus will be on the May through April annual cycle, with all financial reports adjusted for inflation. Much of the debate revolves around the matter of inflation and whether to focus on two-year or four-year cycles. The methodology, methodology used is up to the creators of any report. If they wish their efforts to be effective, that is, seriously considered, they should choose the methodology that will be the most readily received while also providing an honest evaluation. This is not an academic environment where precision is paramount. We are an organization with a mission that must learn to coalesce in order to to accomplish the mission. And in our case, the mission is a steep climb. We cannot afford to prioritize debate over methodology, uh, debate uh, about methodology over evaluation of our effectiveness. The CLC's report focuses on three areas, financial health, membership, and ballot access. Let's walk through each, starting with financial health. I believe the CLC's report prioritizes a desired methodology over effective communication. The visible result on social media was mostly the same sides taking the same side. I have no preference personally whether a report focuses on two or four year cycles. Similarly, at face value, I have no significant preference for whether a report adjusts for inflation or not. However, I have some thoughts on it. But let's lay out the arguments for and against it. In favor of adjusting for inflation, Jonathan Casey reiterated on Twitter that adjusting for inflation was necessary to determine the party's, quote, ability to do things. He further states that adjusting for inflation provides the, quote, real world revenue of value, real value of revenue. In other words, just how far will say $1,000 go in, say, 2023, compared to prior years. In opposition to adjusting for inflation, Todd Hagopian's argument against it is that for, quote, inflation adjustment to be legitimate, the libertarian dues would have to have kept up with inflation. He points out that dues have remained $25 since 1991, and had they been adjusted to keep up with inflation, would roughly be about $55 in 2023. Clearly, we are the party of economic nerds, and if nothing else, that comment will at least be spot on. I'm not nearly as well versed in economics as others. However, I would like to offer the perspective that maybe both of them are somewhat correct. However, I do find adjusting for inflation incomplete. It is true that $1,000 raised in 2023 does not go nearly as far as it did in, say, 2021, the year following the prior convention where delegates voted for a chair. My issue with adjusting for inflation is that it skews comparing 2023 against any prior year, the basis for most of this report's conclusion. Dues in 2019, the most recent midterm year, were, 20, uh, were, were $25. Adjusted for inflation, they would have been more like 47 
or probably like 45. If dues were regularly adjusted for inflation, they would have affected the total dollars raised for every single year, including 2023, presumably resulting in a lower total revenue. How much lower on any given year is anyone's guess. While the CLC, Mr. Casey, says that adjusting for inflation tells us what the LNC can do on any given year, it neglects that membership dues periodically adjusted for inflation also affect what the LNC can do by virtue of total revenue. One can only speculate what such a chart would look like. Furthermore, focusing on purchasing power from one year to the next is still misleading in my opinion. It rests on the foundation that more money means more results, or better results. The Libertarian Party has long been the third largest political party in the United States, but it trails far behind the Democratic and Republican parties in membership numbers and revenue. Here in Jacksonville, our recent mayoral election showed that money does not necessarily translate into results. One Republican candidate far outraised and outspent opponents, but came in fifth in the primary. Members of our party are no strangers to doing more with less. Now, there is some truth that more money will indeed provide more opportunities for the Libertarian Party. But it's not necessarily true that an LNC who has more will accomplish more than an LNC who has less. The only electoral vote the Libertarian Party has ever received occurred in the 1972 Hospers Nathan campaign. I have no idea what the revenue was like in 1972, but given the party had only formed the year prior and the Hospers campaign only received 3,674 votes, I imagine it really wasn't much. Todd Hagopian, the LNC treasurer, provided a response to many of the charts the CLC report includes. Since I largely agree with his concerns, I'm not interested in rehashing them here. I'll post a link to his comments that others may review. I will offer one somewhat unrelated criticism of the charts in total, and that is white backgrounds for charts, please. I printed the report to read and add notes but I found it annoying because it used unnecessary ink and made note-taking on the charts themselves more difficult. Okay, moving on to more serious matters. The second key area of this report, membership. I will take issue with one chart in particular, the monthly membership chart on page five. Of this chart, the CLC report says, Libertarian Party membership in 2023 2022-2023 was fairly unremarkable until the last four months, where we start to see a worrying trend. Other charts attempt to illustrate similar concerns. The issue I have repeatedly brought up was that a drop in membership may not be as unexpected as presented. The fact of the matter is that the current LNC came in with intentions that many would view as radical. As a testament, some members left the party long before the new LNC came into power. This has been foolishly misunderstood as me saying that losing members was simply part of the plan. That is absurd, and anyone who would make such an argument has no business being on the LNC, much less commenting. Back in the first half of 2021, when many were asking the now LNC chair Angela McArdle about platforming Hotep Jesus, and other such silly questions. I was asking questions that are as relevant today as they were then. I want you to take a listen to my question to her from June of that same year. So that's a great segue into my next question. And to give a little bit of background here, uh, I want to lay some foundation for it. So several years ago in Jacksonville, the railroad company CSX brought in a new CEO and he made some radical changes. And it kind of sounds like you want to also make some radical changes as well, or at least in some, for, for some people it will be radical, right? Maybe it won't be necessarily, I don't think it's going to be as radical as what he did. I don't know if you had even heard about it, probably not because you're out in California, but they were pretty radical. Um, and some months later, uh, there were some news articles that were highlighting some delivery problems from the railroad. And the CEO said this, and I'm, I'm quoting here. He said, this resistance to change has resulted in some service disruptions. And 
end quote there. I objected, saying that as a leader, his plan should have considered that resistance and that the failure actually lay on his shoulders. And then I also objected, it really came across like, I'm the leader, but I'm blaming all the workers. It's their fault for not engaging in my vision that was so great and, and, and wondrous. So if, if you're elected to chair of the LNC, it, it feels like just from watching things online, it feels like you're all but guaranteed to have some level of resistance. And so how will you prepare and lead the party to be successful and implement your vision knowing that this resistance is probably going to come? My question of foresight was not that the Mises Caucus intentionally was planning to have a drop in membership, but rather the significant change in direction that they intended to take the party would likely result in disruption. And that disruption may be an understood consequence for which there should be a plan to address. Now let's look at the last of the three key areas, ballot access report. There really isn't much in the report to comment on. It's 124 words to say ballot access issues continue to be a challenge and the party needs to unify in order to overcome obstacles. Well, yeah, of course. In his 1995 book, A Mathematician Reads the Newspaper, professor of mathematics John Allen Paulos tells us this, even after reading with the greatest discernment, we will sometimes remain baffled by what we read for the irredeemable reason that the world is baffling. It's sheer size, intricate connectivity, sensitive dependencies, self-referential tangles, random juxtapositions, and meaningless coincidences ensure this. Add the uncharted and nonlinear interactions within, between, and among disparate systems, and you come up with a complexity with a capital C. Almost any bunkum has some partial validity, and we regularly read into the confusing mess what we want to see. Paulus admonishes us to, quote, always be smart, seldom be certain. But does this mean we should never hold anyone accountable because the world is too complex to ever really be certain? Absolutely not. If our goal is to secure candidate nominations, win elections, and advance legislation, and to do so with the vital necessity of coalescing, then it's far past time for the party members to hold each other accountable in ways that move the body forward rather than challenge each other with metrics sure to invigorate debate. The CLC should ask themselves if they really believe this report would motivate those with whom they disagree to do things differently. My suspicion is that they are unsurprised by the reaction. In this report's conclusion, the CLC writes, quote, the last year after last year after Reno, the CLC stated that we see a future for the National Libertarian Party characterized by electoral failure, irrelevancy, and pandering to a small niche of political groups. The party is already experiencing a wave of disaffiliations from candidates, donors, and recurring members. Sadly, as this report has shown, this prediction is proving accurate. The past 12 months have been among the worst in Libertarian Party history, and there is nothing that suggests the trend will change anytime soon. Paulus, the mathematician I just cited, makes another astute statement in his book, and I believe it's very relevant. If one knows enough to make a prediction of discovery with any confidence, then one has essentially already made the discovery. Only routine checking remains. At the beginning, in the introduction, the CLC stated, this report will attempt to refrain from finger-pointing or blame allocation. We will try not to dwell on how we arrived here, but rather how we can move forward. Assume for the moment that the CLC's prediction was indeed a discovery and one with solid confidence. This is the question I would ask of them. Rather than waiting an entire year to report on what you were certain was to be true, what did you do to alter the party's course? I'm always puzzled by how libertarians plan to advance legislation with two parties who hate them when they consistently fail to gain buy-in within their own party. In the book, Anatomy of the State, read by many libertarians, Rothbard says this of the state, It is also important for the state to make its rule seem inevitable, 
even if, if its reign is disliked, it will then be met with passive resignation. Observation over time suggests to me that many libertarians met the new LNC with that same passive resignation, some before the so-called takeover even occurred. Like many citizens do with the state, many libertarians spent much time complaining and very little time doing the things necessary to gain any momentum towards change that they would like to see. In retrospect, it seems clear that asking about future disruption was far more valuable than who gets access to a microphone. Arguing over adjusting for inflation in the last few days doesn't appear to have persuaded anyone. But let's move on and look at their recommendations for today. I fundamentally disagree with all of them, and this segment will have my strongest criticism of the report. Not a single one provides historical metrics or ties them with data directly to any of the three key areas. Remember, they were financial health, membership, and ballot access. Let's briefly walk through each one. Recommendation number one, understanding and reversing membership decline. This LNC also needs to listen to the members, particularly lifetime members, who are leaving and not only listen, but also act on what they are being told. Real leadership, real leadership serves those who lead, and that starts by listening first and acting second. Continuing to dismiss members' concerns will only further the decline. Many members have left stating that they are no longer desire that they no longer desire to be part of the party so long as members of the Mises caucus were in the party. They used words like white supremacy and bigotry, among others. In order to listen to those members, the LNC would need to practically resign in its entirety and leave the party. This recommendation does not say to what end the LNC should listen to parting members, nor does it account for attracting new members or balancing both those existing and potential new members. Recommendation number two, addressing internal challenges. The near 80% turnover rate in staff since Reno and rumors of a toxic environment is also a contributor to membership's lack of faith in leadership. A concerted effort should be made to create a positive working culture and to make sure staff aren't hampered by badly defined roles, lack of tools, or micromanagement by LNC members. Okay, first, let me nitpick here. Without confident polling, calling an 80% turnover rate in staff a, quote, contributor to membership's lack of faith in leadership, well, that's, that's basically made up. That may be true of those who have left the party, but then they are no longer, quote, membership. Second, rumors of a toxic environment are anecdotal, not data or evidence, and it isn't clear how toxic environment is being defined. How can I agree or disagree without knowing how it's defined and having more than just rumors to work with? Third, people may remember back in June of 2022, it was also reported that internal records showed Twitter also had an 80% reduction. People then said similar things as they are now of the LNC. That isn't to suggest an 80% turnover is necessarily a good thing. It may not be. And obviously, the LNC is not Twitter. But without supporting data, 80% is just a big, scary number. Recommendation number three, revitalizing major donor relationships. It's clear that relationships with large ticket donors have been lost. We are glad to hear that a fundraising committee is being formed, but wonder why it took nine months of the worst revenue in 30 years to make it happen. Regardless, this is an effort that every LNC member should be finding ways to support. Okay, this recommendation isn't even really a recommendation. By its own admission, this report acknowledges that a fundraising committee is already being formed and there isn't any indication that any LNC member opposes it, nor that any ever have. Recommendation number four, refocus messaging. The LP should refocus its messaging to appeal to the broader liberty movement, not a small niche of it. Messaging has fallen into an echo chamber and it isn't representative of most members. As members, donors, 
candidates, elected officials, and even affiliates disassociate, it is clear that the current messaging needs a change to stop driving people away. More on how messaging could be used to unite libertarians instead of divide them in the next section. Similar to recommendation number two, this is speculation. That messaging is not representative of, quote, most members, their words, not mine, is not presented with supporting data. And how much of the messaging are we actually talking about? That's important to know because data from members might say that they either agree with or are unconcerned with, say, 80% of the messaging that goes out. That would leave 20% that is unsatisfactory. The next logical question is to what degree is the remaining 20% contributing to issues with, again, financial health, membership, and ballot access issues? Above and beyond, however, any prior year. Recall that in 2021, the prior LNC held a fundraising drive to raise $30,000 for an anti-mandate ad. I was very much in support, but was told by several people they refused to be a member or donate any money until the LNC uh, proved itself to them. There are always members who are turned off by party messaging. To accurately gauge this requires having a baseline to compare against, not just show that it's happening. This isn't to say that messaging cannot be addressed. I want you to take a moment and I want you to do this. Google Twitter advanced search. In the search criteria, I want you to type in shit posting, all one word. Under from these accounts, I want you to type in comic Dave Smith. Again, all one word. I want you to look at the number of times Dave Smith has criticized shitposting. Just this month, he even tweeted, tweeted <clears throat> I asked our guys to cut out the shitposting in 21. If you remember, we'd been better off if that advice had been taken. You may not agree with Dave, whoever is running the LNC Twitter account, or the many Mises, Mises members on what the messaging needs to be. But... Why would you not try and reach out to work with Dave to influence at least the edgier messaging as it's been called later in this report? Recommendation number five, restoring customized candidate training programs. It's also time to provide donors with as many reasons to give as possible. The LNC should restart the training that they ended. Our candidates and affiliates deserve customized training. Third-party candidates need more than just what the conservative leadership institute is providing. Libertarian Party candidates will get far more from, our, from a curriculum customized for our candidates than a curriculum designed to develop conservative activists. Members are looking for a value add, and this is one way to give them that. As a side note, the CLC is planning on providing customized training later this year. Once again... What data is there to support a change in candidate training as the cause of low donations? Furthermore, what evidence is there that customized training is more effective for Libertarian candidates than what the Leadership Institute pr provides? The Libertarian Party of Florida provided that very training a while back, and I attended. While the class had definitely a conservative tilt, the instructor appeared to understand differences by periodically pointing out a few training slides obviously written for conservatives, but how they were applicable to libertarians. Now, if the answer to the question of evidence is to present the number of libertarians who have, over the years, taken customized training and been elected, then we must ask, compared to what? Without comparing elected libertarians who received customized training to uh, le elected libertarians who received leadership institute training, then the number of elected libertarians are not evidence. They are assumptions. Recommendation number six, stop suing libertarians. Libertarian party donors simply don't want their dollars going to sue other libertarians. The cost of attorneys is one the party can ill afford, much less the hit to donations these lawsuits will bring about. Instead of using the force of the state against each other, let's get to the mediation table and deal with these disputes in a way that doesn't drive members away. I suspect the very first sentence holds true. It's not one I'd really argue with. That said, like the recommendations before, 
It does not provide data on the particular lawsuits or potential lawsuits and that the LNC may engage with. While I personally don't want my dollars going to sue other libertarians, I may not want something else even more. Or because these legal issues are regarding three state affiliates, Michigan, New Mexico, and Massachusetts, I may simply be ambivalent since none of them are my state, Florida, and I'm much less familiar with the issues in those states because I don't need to be. Without evidence, the argument seems intuitive, but it isn't backed by data. Finally, recommendation number seven, fewer secret meetings. Executive sessions have proliferated during this LNC more than any in recent memory. If there weren't rumors of its misuse, ex uh, excessive secrecy leads to members distrusting leadership. Restoring openness and transparency with members should be a top priority. Moving forward, this recommendation does not define recent memory. Are we talking about the last LNC or the last three? And since every defined metric goes back over many years, why limit this metric? If executive sessions have increased, then it's important to know by how much and why. I agree that too much secrecy leads to distrust and that executive session should only be used when absolutely necessary. The challenge is that members cannot know what is discussed. Otherwise, it wouldn't be an executive session. But again, the key areas of this report were on financial health, membership, and ballot access. Like any of the prior recommendations, it is on the CLC to directly link these recommendations to measurable changes in the reported key areas. Simply saying that if an event has occurred or occurred more frequently or that it breeds distrust may be factually correct, but it doesn't prove that is what is happening or that is where the change must be made. <sighs> okay, this episode is getting longer than I wanted. Let me address just one point from the Dallas Accord 2.0 section of the CLC report before I go on to my conclusion. The CLC report states, the Libertarian Party messaging should also avoid the distraction from our mission that is the culture war. The culture war is little more than an excuse to give the government more power over individuals. Many LP members left the duopoly precisely because of them using the culture war to sell authoritarianism. Politics should be kept separate from the culture war and the LP should lead by an example. The message of the Libertarian Party should be clear. Liberty is not a participant in the culture war. It is the solution to it. You know, I hear a lot of voices claiming the Libertarian Party should avoid the culture war. What I don't hear are voices that acknowledge that many members from all sides engage in the culture war on a very regular basis. The truth of the matter is that the culture war is part of libertarian culture, whether we are willing to admit it or not. Now, you might rightfully challenge back by asking me to qualify that by saying, DL, compared to who that isn't. Well, as it turns out, I was reminded of a perfect example just before sitting down to finish preparing for this episode. On Memorial Day, after a trip to the zoo with the family, we were all at home in the kitchen eating. My son told Alexa to play The Floor is Lava, a favorite song of his and many other children. Many of you may know that my wife was born and raised in Indonesia, coming here for college and staying thereafter, clearly to meet me. Indonesia is within the Ring of Fire, a region of the planet known for volcanoes and earthquakes. Indonesia has 76 current active volcanoes. I looked at my wife and I jokingly asked, I, I, I'm not joking, I actually said this in a joking manner. Since there are so many volcanoes in Indonesia, is this song offensive to Indonesians? My wife looked at me and sharply and very impolitely said, who the heck cares? And that is her answer to even the hot button culture war topics. She literally refuses to engage. She has no time for it. She doesn't engage with her version and then just later label it being principled or what have you. She simply refuses. Oh, 
And you should have seen the look she gave me when I excitedly told her that this exchange would be great for the very podcast episode that I was working on. So whenever you meet her or see her, you might want to give her a little bit of a thanks for her patience. Now let's get on to that conclusion. The idea of caucuses providing an LNC report is fantastic. I think it's a great idea and there is much room for future value. Reports will differ in what key areas they focus, the methodology they use, and the recommendations they offer. That's a good thing. If caucuses provide membership information in their reports as well, that is, members who are either inactive or active in the party at the local, state, and national level, then the LNC gets the best picture of what their membership really wants. Rather than speculative phrases like, members want, Reports can state what their members want or even what a given percentage of their members want. And when I say their members, I do mean the individual caucuses or whatever group is producing the report. The CLC report starts by stating a focus on three key areas, financial health, membership, and ballot access. All are appropriate. I wasn't motivated to argue either two or four year cycles. By adjusting for inflation, I do think the CLC opens itself up for additional criticism that distracts from what should be the goal of the report, to influence the party. My limited understanding of economics suggests that adjusting for inflation presents the picture as worse than it is, while at the same time ignoring that incentives change behavior. The price of membership hasn't changed since 1991. Had it been adjusted for inflation, then it would greatly affect membership and financial health, likely lowering both. The question of whether the trend would evenly lower overall or whether any given year would distinctly change is unknown. Ultimately, what I suspect is that most readers will simply look at charts, see numbers, and lines. The argument to adjust for inflation in order to accurately compare purchasing power seems either bad faith or a failure to understand how information is generally consumed. Despite being the party of economic nerds, I think most people are primed to see graphical data as either good or bad. And I believe the CLC knows this and prioritized a worse appearance over seeking productive dialogue. Even Jonathan Casey himself tweeted a side-by-side comparison of charts, one adjusting for inflation, the other not. And in that same tweet, he wrote, the numbers are still abysmal. Whether they are or not can be argued, but the point is, he acknowledged that he could have had a, a chart that illustrates their concern with the LNC. I find the membership report section fails to consider the dramatic change in leadership and vision when comparing against prior years. This leads to speculation in the recommendations, which appears to include membership complaints from former members. It also leads to not asking more relevant questions or attaining measurable responses from leadership. Though ballot access is very important and a reasonable key area to include, the CLC report merely states the obvious but provides nothing of substance to judge the LNC on. And like the matter of finance and membership, it fails to connect any of the recommendations to ballot access improvement with data or evidence. I'm going to quote from one final book, since I've obviously been in kind of a mood for this episode citing books. In the book, Monday Morning Communications, Tony Jiri states, In terms of individual communications, the sender is primarily responsible for the success of a communication. If I want you to do something, change your thinking about something, or simply want you to come to a meeting tomorrow at 3 o'clock, it's my responsibility to ensure you receive my message in a form that's readily understood. I call it the you touch it, you own it rule of communications. Whether we're senders, receivers, or supervisors of a communications process, we all have responsibilities to make sure messages are as clear, efficient, and effective as they can be. This LNC report card is a great idea. Again, it's one I hope that is continued and adopted by more groups within the Libertarian Party. However, the execution has room for improvement. Rather than read like earnest critique that might persuade the LNC or observers to take even some of the advice, 
It reads like a 20-page confirmation of what critics already believe and have no interest in reconsidering otherwise. Furthermore, the recommendations appear to only suggest returning to the ways of old and disregarding the many members who have found those ways ineffective or needing refinement. That isn't listening to members. Now, my final sticking point is the lack of anything positive about the LNC. The report is entirely negative. If we're following the idea that communication ought to be effective, given the current division within the party, the CLC should step back and ask themselves what they thought they would accomplish with such a negative report. I've had several people reach out to discuss this report or suggest going on another podcast. After putting this episode together, I have decided that unless the report is fundamentally changed, there is no need. I will not engage in any further debate over the report or over this episode. I said what I said, and I'm too busy to engage in endless debate. Others are encouraged to do likewise. Now, I hope you enjoyed this episode and walk away with something to think about. That goes for both Mises and non-Mises members of the Liberty Movement. It is my belief the party can accomplish great things. What stands in our way the most is non-messaging, money, or lack of donors or candidates. They're important, but what stands in our way is our own selves. So long as we continue to engage each other in ways that spin the wheels of debate but provide no traction, we will lose regardless who is steering the ship. Okay, that's all for this episode. As always, stay safe, guard your liberty. Until next time.